I felt my heart warm towards all of you uh, during that moment in reflecting on the video, and I'm just so grateful to see all of your faces here this morning. And for the faces that I can't see who are watching online, uh, welcome all the same. So it's good to see you all this morning. My name is Drew Peterson. I'm the associate pastor here at Faith Reformed Church, uh, and I'll be bringing God's word to you this, this morning. So we are continuing in our Lenten series on listening for the questions. And I'm very excited about this series because I've grown to love a good question. It caused me to imagine, it caused me to reflect the anticipation of those light bulb moments, coming to know what I previously didn't know, it can actually bring me joy. I also think a good question is much like an unidentified seed in one's hand. There's so much potential in that seed, so much mystery about what it will grow into. Its shape, its size, the color, the fruit that it will bear, the leaf shape, the type of bark, the root system, and so on. A good question results in even more questions, some of which are easy to answer. Others leave us still curious, and still others leave us completely bewildered. So much can linger in one good question. And there are two questions in the passage we'll be reading this morning. The first one comes from the disciples, and the second one comes from Jesus. And so I want you to listen for these questions as I read Matthew 26, 6 through 13, and I'll be reading from the NRSV. You can follow along on the screen in the bulletin, or if you want, and this is what I typically do, to simply close my eyes and to imagine the scene played out in my mind. Matthew 26, 6 through 13. Now, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this waste? For this oil could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has performed a good service for me. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this oil on the body, on my body, she has pre prepared me for burial. And truly I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done for me will be told in remembrance of her. This is the word of the Lord. So let's jump right into the text. Right here in verse 6, we have Simon the leper. Who is Simon the leper? It's believed that this is a man that Jesus previously healed from leprosy, thus the name Simon the leper. Even in Mark and John's accounts of this story, no more mention is given to this man's identity. Then in verse 7, a woman walks into the room carrying an expensive oil mixed with rare perfumes and pours it on Jesus' head. In John, it's Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha. And in Luke, it's the sinful woman who entered the Pharisee's house. And this is a different woman who's recorded in Mark 14, 3 through 9. And there's speculation and in-depth investigation on these accounts trying to clarify the missing details that might provide greater clarity to the accounts that have been provided in the Gospels. So my recommendation is to hold this story without too much consideration of the other accounts. It could be more distracting than an aid in understanding what Jesus is trying to communicate to us this morning. And so here we have this woman. She's entered the house and she's created this dynamic, awkward, and outrageous scene. It was the kind of moment that made mouths just drop open and just stare in bewilderment at what was happening it would have raised many questions. Why such extravagance? And, and who is this woman? Who just let her walk in? How did she get her hands on an alabaster jar of oil? Did she steal it? Why is she pouring it on the head of Jesus? What does this all mean? The disciples make known their curiosity and with a significant level of judgment. Why this waste? For no one empties such a valuable oil on someone's head. And this, as I mentioned, is no ordinary oil. 
It was likely mixed with frankincense and other expensive exotic perfumes. It was probably valued at a year's wages. It's very expensive. One simply does not do such a wasteful thing. It's meant to sit upon a mantle in the home signifying one's wealth and status. It's intended to be an heirloom. It's also meant to be used to honor a dearly loved family member who has passed away. And as I read it, the disciples were interested in maximizing this gift. They wanted it to be saved and then sold to feed the poor, which is not a bad idea at all. In fact, I think it's a great idea. It's an idea that churches and individuals alike make all the time. How do we maximize this gift for maximum efficiency in God's kingdom? How do we take a significant gift or inheritance, put it into investment, and give that interest to those in need? That way, it will provide for years and years to come. It's wise investing, isn't it? I genuinely think this is a really good idea. It aligns even with what the early church practice was. They were selling their possessions to give to the poor. I don't think the disciples' suggestion Jesus would have opposed other than one big glaring fact. It was worship. The jar of perfumed oil was not wasted as it ran down his head, onto his face and beard, and then dripped down onto his clothes. It wasn't broken and poured out in haste or out of excess. It wasn't an accident or a self-promoting gesture on the woman's behalf to gain recognition. It was worship. Perhaps you recall when kings were anointed in the Old Testament, it was common to pour oil upon one's head and then have it drip down their beard as they were commissioned to their position. This moment was like that, and yet it was much more. It was unfettered, unconfined, unconstrained worship. It was both pure adoration and homage to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It was both beautiful and it was morally good. It was both beautiful and morally good. And there's another act of element in this worship. One with a unique twist that makes this moment all the more powerful. It's subtle, but it's rich with history and meaning. And for anyone who's read through the book of Leviticus, likely skimmed past this part. It can be dry at times. But in Leviticus 2, there are instructions on presenting grain offerings mixed with oil that are then offered as a sacrifice to God. Can you see the correlation to what is being done? This woman is pouring out oil upon the bread of life, who would be the sacrifice for us. There's one of those light bulb moments for me. So was this really a waste? Isn't selling it and using the money to buy food for the poor also an act of worship? Isn't it an act of humility to give of one's abundant wealth so God and the church and one's community might experience God's kingdom come about in some beautiful way? The answer is yes, but not in this instance, because Jesus is worthy of praise before our acts of service. God wants our hearts before he wants our hands. And this is freeing news to all of you who might feel like you have to get your act together before God accepts you. He just wants your heart. It's also good news for people who, like me, often feel like I have to continually prove myself to belong in this family. God just wants my heart. God's open arms welcome us all to come and to give our hearts to him, to confess our wrongdoings and turn from our sins and then live foreverly, forever grateful for his redemption in our lives. And if you remember what we just read, the act of worship by this woman came from a committed and devoted heart to Christ. Not out of obligation, not out of tradition, not out of obedience, not out of pressure from others, 
but she offered it her heart, her most valued possession, even her sense of decorum, dignity, to Christ simply because she wanted to praise him. So the question to us is this, what praise do you offer Christ? Let me give you a moment to think about that. What praise do you offer to Christ? I want to use a little analogy. I have an old offering plate here, and I hope it doesn't break. Um, but I'm going to put it right here. It might be hard to see, but I'm going to throw some stuff in here. Um, I think I owe God all my money, which is really sad because there isn't any in here. Uh, but there's a credit card and my driver's license, my identity. I can give that to God. I can also put in my phone, my contacts, my schedule, um, all, all of that. Pictures of family, they're in there as well. I can also give God uh, my house, my job, and my freedom, transportation. I can give God all that. And I can even say that I want to give God myself. Oh, geez. Uh-oh. Yeah, there goes my phone if it breaks. Whew. So we can say we give God all of who we are by offering ourselves and all that we are by putting it in the offering plate. Part of me actually hoped that would break, thinking that I'm such a great blessing. It would break it, but it didn't. Okay. All the same. All the same. I know it's my failing, and perhaps it's yours as well, to confess to truly love God, but not really give him what he wants the very most. He wants a surrendered heart, which is truly the most prized possession that all of us have to give. Even more than the oil poured out on Jesus' head, the heart of this woman was the real gift. The real gift that you have to offer is your heart. Our hearts, our very lives, need to be poured out like streams of worship upon Christ's head. Our praise anoints his head as Lord and King. And even when we fall silent because words are not enough, our hearts should beat for him. Our lungs should breathe for him. And now to the second question. The question that Jesus asked, which is stated in verse 10. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? I, I have often had a hard time saying this, but conviction is a gift. Even saying it makes it stick in my mouth a little bit. For it reminds me that God is still at working away at chiseling away all that doesn't belong in my life. It's God sanctifying our lives to make us more like Christ. It's uncomfortable to be sure. And yet I'm reminded that I am loved each moment that I am convicted because God disciplines his children. Discipline is an act of love. Why do you trouble this woman? And so when Jesus asked this, why do you trouble this woman? The spirit reminds me that I need to stop hindering others' praise. I'm reminded not to look down on those in other denominations that like to dance and wave flags during their services. I'm reminded not to dismiss all the pomp and glamour of an Orthodox service either. I am reminded that we are all called to give whatever it is that we have, our very lives, to give it generously to the giver of all things. And Jesus reminds me, and I think he reminds us all of this in Mark 12, 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor woman came and put in two very small copper coins, only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor woman has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. 
It's the heart of the worshiper that touches the heart of God. And if the heart is in the right place, the amount and value of the gift could be anything. And yet giving generously, generously reveals a surrendered heart of faith. Jesus continues this gentle rebuke by sharing that this, what this woman did was of good service to him. She actually prepared his body for burial while he was still alive. For he was as good as dead at this point. And if you didn't know, being a criminal, being killed as a criminal, there was usually no anointing the body with oil before burial. But because Jesus is our spotless lamb of God who knows no sin but became sin for us, it was right for him to be anointed with oil before burial. For Jesus was no criminal and should receive his proper anointing before being buried. And can you sense the prophetic nature in this act of worship? There's so much more going on than just pouring out oil. Then Jesus continues to say that the good news of what has happened here today will be announced to the whole world and her act will live on throughout the ages. And is this not prophetically true as well? Are we not talking about this act of worship in this moment? Even now, as Jesus' disciples, we are being challenged to come and to understand that giving our very best possessions, our hearts, and our lives to Jesus, it's not wasteful. It's not wasteful. It's the highest form of worship. Although not all of us have been healed by a disease, we have all been healed of the leprosy of sin. By the very blood and body of Christ, our sacrificial our sacrificial Savior, he has saved us. And if this is your story, then you have much to be thankful for. For what are possessions in light of eternal life? We come into this world with nothing, and we leave this world with nothing. So why in the world should we think that we should make our heaven here and now on earth? It can only hinder us. For as Jesus says in Matthew 19, 24, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. To put it another way, one author writes this. Do not be anxious. Earthly possessions dazzle our eyes and delude us into thinking that they can provide security and freedom from anxiety. Yet all the time, they're the very source of all anxiety. If our hearts are set on them, our reward is an anxiety whose burden is intolerable. The challenge for us, for those who have so much wealth and privilege, enter a place of worship when we enter in Faith Reformed Church or log in online is to seek what we can get from Jesus and not what we can give him. This can be true for some of us. And if we can keep our consumeristic mindset, we remain anxious when we are not, when we're not feeling it. We blame the music, the liturgy, the preacher, the people around us. And if our anxiety doesn't rest upon them, then we become anxious that something is wrong with us. Oh man, perhaps an unforgiven sin, a distracted heart, a hardened heart, and a distracted mind. The anxiety only burrows deeper into our hearts. For what we really want is for God to remove our anxiety, to make us free, and for Jesus to extravagantly pour the oil of the Spirit on our heads and fill us with love and joy and peace. And this is good. This is very good. But the issue is that we end up wanting everything without ever offering ourselves. I don't mean this to be harsh, but at times we become like squawking seagulls over bread tossed on the ground, trying to get our fill before flying away, looking for the next thing that will satisfy us. This is very true in my life. But if we pause and consider the love he has for us and the extent he went to prove that love, we would not want anything more from him in fact, we would want to give him our lives fully and completely as an act of worship. We would want to become the living sacrifice set on fire for our Lord. For it is our God who calls us, 
It is him who forgives us. It is him who adopts us as his own. It is him who clothes us with his spirit and sends us on an adventure to bring the good news into a war-ridden, polarized, and frightening world. So come, let us recognize our need to give our hearts to God. Let's give him our lives by humbly taking the body and the blood of Christ as our nourishment so that we might truly give our lives to him.